Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's special program. I'm Dan Lewin, President and CEO of CHM. As we close our 2021 Fellow Award year in these unprecedented times, I'm excited to celebrate human creativity at the intersection of technology and art. It is a crucial part of what makes us human. The story of human creativity can be traced back tens of thousands of years to cave paintings and other forms of art. The history of digital computing technology is much shorter, only about nine decades long. But it's remarkable that from almost the very beginning, art and computing were intertwined. Engineers building the first UNIVAC computers at the opening of the 1950s made them play music. Later in the decade, researchers working on the Whirlwind computer at MIT created graphics, animations, and even the screenplay for a television western. And all of that was just the beginning. Tonight, we honor Lillian F. Schwartz, an artist who early on saw the digital computer as a tool for creativity, a new medium for art. Through her work, she also inspired technologists to create fresh innovations. And her story is itself an inspiration, one of creativity, breaking boundaries, and overcoming adversity. We're proud to honor her as a new CHM fellow. Here's a short video highlighting some of the 91 fellows we have celebrated over the past three decades. In the words of Dr. Katherine Johnson, and I quote, you are providing a platform for so many to share their story, and together we are rewriting history in a way that allows everyone to see their place. For more than three decades, the Computer History Museum has reserved one honor for a distinguished circle of individuals who have advanced the field of computing. So I figured that if I could start on the ground floor with other people, then I'd have a chance to get ahead. And that was what led me to write the first compiler back in 1952. And it was set up as a, as a crusade rather than to make money. The CHM Fellow Awards recognize technology pioneers, legends, and unsung heroes who have illuminated our world and propelled humanity forward. The semiconductor industry has made bigger changes in a few decades than printing has over a few centuries. When these things actually start to connect, you get the wow effect. Democracy, freedom, prosperity, they all stem from technological innovation. We've got to make a society that will last, that is sustainable as a society. That's one of the reasons I developed my computer and gave it away. I wanted to help that revolution go forward. If every one of us does our job well, it'll all go very interesting. When the ideas start, they are fragile and they're new. And most people don't understand them. And the things that are fragile need to be protected. They are the dreamers who imagine beyond what is, the disruptors who challenge convention, the builders who transform our world. They are the history makers who inspire us all to keep exploring and creating new ways to shape a better future for everyone. Lillian Schwartz is our fourth and final fellow award recipient for 2021. The museum is honored to preserve and share her remarkable story of creativity, experimentation, and perseverance. Celebrating human creativity and empowering the creator and all of us are part of CHM's work as we decode technology, the computing past, the digital present, and the future impact on humanity. In response to the pandemic, CHM has accelerated how we deliver on our museum's mission by reaching audiences around the world online. We have presented a dynamic programming series exploring the history, present, and future of technology, reaching our community from Silicon Valley to Shanghai. 
we've created a new online educational game excuse me, with companion educational resources for our youth audiences. And we're hard at work on new platforms that will unlock our rich collections, from artifacts to oral histories, and from audiovisuals to archives, in an effort we are calling Open CHM. We are solidifying ideas for new and exciting exhibits on creativity and technology for when we fully reopen in person. And we're committed to including an increasingly diverse array of voices in everything we do. All of this is part of how we are reimagining CHM to empower millions of people around the world to make and use technology for positive social impact. As part of this transformation, we're partnering with leading technology companies to see how the latest innovations can best serve the museum's mission. One exciting example of this work is our partnership with Accenture to build the museum's digital twin. CHM's digital twin will enable museum visitors from around the world to interact in this high definition virtual reality environment and experience our programming and exhibits in new ways. We're looking forward to welcoming people from around the globe to virtually visit our building in the heart of Silicon Valley. You will be able to explore our unique exhibits, discover, learn, and share your views with others. In our Han Auditorium, you will be able to gather with a global audience for discourse, collaboration, conferences, or celebrations. Over time, we envision offering open access to dynamic physical and digital experiences to anyone, anywhere, anytime, in their own language. In the near future, we want you to come explore and imagine with us. I hope you're as excited as I am about the possibilities of our digital twin and all of CHM's ongoing efforts. All these dynamic changes are made possible through our incredible museum trustees and team, as well as our fantastic donors, sponsors, and partners. Accenture is both an extraordinary strategic partner for building our new digital twin, as well as for presenting our 2021 fellow program. This is the eighth year that Accenture has provided support as our headline sponsor, and we couldn't be more pleased to be innovating together to create our museum of the future. So it is with special appreciation that I now introduce CHM trustee and group chief executive of technology and CTO of Accenture, Paul Doherty. Paul? Thank you, Daniel. And once again, I'm pleased to be among everyone who supports the Computer History Museum and this celebration of the remarkable men and women innovating at the very edge of technology and human ingenuity. Our very presence here today, whether in person or virtually from all reaches of the globe, speaks to the resilience, brilliance and creativity of the human spirit amid these extraordinary times. With the recent unveiling of this museum's digital twin, we've shown that we can create and experience special and unique interactions despite distance, technical and timing limitations and other obstacles. And such work rests upon the shoulders of innovative giants who've come before us. We could not have weathered challenges and disruption without their contributions. How appropriate and essential that we take the time to celebrate and thank them. And one of those digital innovators is with us today. Lillian Schwartz was a pioneer in breaking down the barriers between the physical world and the digital space. With incredible artistry and genius, she translated physical items into digital, creating whole new meanings and an entirely new spectrum of art and innovation. So thank you, Lillian, for your work and inspiration. We honor and celebrate you and your vision. We're living in an extraordinary time and the CHM's mission to provide the continuity across the computing past, the digital present, and the future impact of technology on humanity is even more critical to those of us working in technology today. And it's certainly aligned to Accenture's vision to deliver on the promise of technology and human ingenuity to solve some of the world's biggest challenges and improve the way we live and work. And that's why I'm so pleased and proud to be on the board of trustees of the museum to represent Accenture as sponsor of the 2021 Fellows Program and to honor Lillian Schwartz's induction as a CHM Fellow. Thank you and back to you, Dale. In these extraordinary times, I couldn't agree more about the urgent to work together to deliver on the promise of technology and human ingenuity to solve the world's greatest challenges. 
Thank you, Paul. And thanks to all of our collaborators and friends at Accenture. We also share a focus and commitment to empower the next generation of our education sponsors with First Tech, KLA Foundation, and Oracle. To all of our sponsors, we express appreciation for the generous support that has made possible this special year-long 2021 Fellow Awards program. Thank you. Now, it's my great pleasure to welcome my co-host for tonight's program, Andy Cunningham. Andy is the founder and president of Cunningham Collective, a marketing and communication strategy firm dedicated to bringing innovation to market. She's also the founder of Zero One, a nonprofit focused on the future of art and technology. I'm very grateful that she serves as a CHM trustee. Andy? Thank you, Daniel. I'm really excited to join you here tonight. I want to begin by adding my warm welcome to each of you joining this event this evening. You are also an important part of tonight's story, so there are a few ways that you can participate. First, add your comments to the live chat during the event. You can also join the conversation on social media using the hashtag CHMFellows. Please contribute your voice. As Daniel mentioned, I'm incredibly passionate about art and technology, so I'm especially thrilled to be a part of this program honoring Lillian Schwartz. What a wonderful way to close this year-long Fellows celebration. Yes, it really has been a wonderful year. Looking back at our Fellow Awards series, in March, we honored collaborative technology creator and entrepreneur Raymond Ozzie. In June, we celebrated AI and robotics innovator Raj Reddy. And in September, we recognized computer graphics and hypertext pioneer and computer science educator Andy Van Dam. And now tonight, we honor computer art pioneer Lillian Schwartz. Along the way, we've explored themes of technology and collaboration, diversity and inclusion, equity and ethics. And now tonight, we celebrate creativity. As part of these programs, each fellow was asked to sum up their advice to a young person in one word. Ray chose build. Raj, empower. Andy's word was persistence. And Lillian chose experiment. So now, it's your turn. What is one word of advice that you would give to a young person as we all try to shape a better future? Over the course of tonight's event, we're going to collect your word which we will share at the end of the program. At the top of the chat window, click on the tab that says, share your word. Type in your word and hit submit. It's easy. We can't wait to see the collective wisdom of this amazing community. Back to you, Andy. Let's turn our historical imaginations back to the 1960s, when Lillian Schwartz first began to use the computer as a tool for art. And let's consider the revolutions that were taking place in both art and technology then. Digital computers were being produced and used in much greater numbers, rapidly advancing in their capabilities. And yet, these mainframes and mini computers were predominantly the tools of large organizations, available only to specialists. Few people had seen a computer firsthand, and even fewer had used one. In the art world, an era of avant-garde experimentation was gaining momentum. Artists were investigating new mediums and techniques. In a small community, some coming from computing and others from art, was beginning to connect these revolutions. Let's dive deeper into Lillian Schwartz's journey into computer art. Lillian Schwartz first encountered computer art at a 1968 exhibit at the Museum of Modern Art. The exhibit featured both the long history of artists engaging with technology and machines and new artists making technology into a fresh medium for art. The exhibit featured a multimedia, interactive sculpture by her. And that's where I met Leon Harmon who came to the opening and he was from Bell Laboratories and worked in visual perception and he was very interested in my work and I had done all kinds of graphics and I couldn't understand how this nude that was made up of symbols was made. And he said, would you like to try the program? This code exists, we're not gonna do anything with it. Uh, 
Would you like to come to Bell Labs and try it? Within two days, I went because this was something very exciting to me. At Bell Labs, computer researchers were using their powerful IBM 7094 mainframe to create 2D art and computer animations, generating digital images captured on the mainframe's SC4020 microfilm recorder. Visual artists and musicians were visiting Bell Labs, taking advantage of work in computer graphics, computer animation, and especially in a group led by Max Matthews, computer-generated music. Max Matthews heard about me. I was being hidden, but because he was inventing computer music uh, and he wanted to have films to put his music to. It must have been months later that the computer scientist who worked with Leon Knowlton came into the room and chatted. I was complaining and saying, I wish I had more software here. And, uh, and then I heard this voice behind me saying, well, what would you want? And then we spent hours where I was telling him all the things I would like. And he would come back, he was writing things on the blackboard and say, well, I can do this, but I can't do that. And uh, I soon had a very simple software, but I could do animation. I could overlap and make rectangles. And so the early films had a lot of that. And I only got very little footage out of it, but I ended up doing some hand animation. But I also, added all kinds of other materials to, to extend the film and to make, you know, use a more liquid look to it at times. And that's why the films have so many other images. Lillian Schwartz's needs as an artist pushed Ken Knowlton and others to develop their technologies, producing fresh computer animations that she transformed into a series of art films in the 1970s. Her films were shown widely at important museums to great acclaim, expanding the aesthetic space for computer films. So let's see what Lillian created. First, we want to feature one of her first films using computer animation, mixing black and white animations with hand colorings, all overlaid with a Moog synthesizer soundtrack by Gershon Kingsley. Lillian's creative process began with months of painstaking work, resulting in only just a few seconds of computer-generated animation. To complete the film and add color, she created painted sequences by pouring pigment on glass plates. In the finished work, she juxtaposed the machine and handmade visuals in a dynamic and compelling rhythm. Thanks to a generous loan from the Henry Ford in Michigan, we now present this excerpt from Lillian Schwartz's award-winning film, Pixelation.
absolutely amazing. Or maybe I should say, far out, man. And now, to deepen our understanding of Lillian's contributions, we want to welcome a professor of contemporary art and computational media at Stony Brook University. She wrote an award-winning book titled Peripheral Visions on Bell Labs Output Technologies and Early Computer Art. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Zabette Patterson. Thank you, Andy. According to Nobel laureate Arno Penzias, what we now know as computer art began in December of 1968 with Lillian Schwartz. That year, she visited Bell Labs for the first time. She would remain there for three decades, pushing the boundaries of what was possible with computer graphic technology. The laboratory director, Max Matthews, initially introduced her as the lab's morphodynamicist. But she later took an official, proper, paid position as a consultant in computer graphics. On that first day at Bell Labs, Lillian Schwartz saw integrated circuits. She saw punch cards. She saw cables and a light pin. She was dazzled by the arrays of lights that were visible on the computers. They were flickering off and on. In the coming days and months, Lillian Schwartz learned the concepts, the hows and whys of bits, transistors, processing units, and cathode ray tubes. She called Bell Labs a masterpiece of odd geniuses. And she was, of course, one of them. Her experiments there began with pixelation, an astonishing hybrid film that fused computer-generated imagery with hand-painted animation and photo micrographs of crystals forming. Over her career, she wrote programs. She created editing techniques and color filters. She invented new ways of both analyzing and generating images. The stunning films and graphics that she made remain foundational works at the intersection of art and technology. Her films and still images drag the viewer into wild new worlds, full of color and unpredictable shapes. These works have garnered her international acclaim in the art world. Her work has been exhibited and collected by the Museum of Modern Art, the Met, the New Museum, and the Whitney Museum of American Art in New York City, the Moderna Museum in Stockholm, the Grand Palais Museum in Paris, among others, spread all across the globe. In scientific circles, she has been a crucial interlocutor and collaborator to computer programmers and engineers, but also to statisticians and physicists. To turn to Arno Penzias again, those who worked with her in those days still remember her monumental ingratitude to technology. As each problem was solved and each new capability came into hand, a new round of probing explorations would begin and off she would be, asking for the impossible all over again. It was this ingratitude that led her to push the graphic and representational possibilities of the computer to its limits and beyond, making marvelous works of art that still shock and surprise contemporary viewers, and that still shape new possibilities for art, for science, and for computational technologies. Zabat, thank you for your eloquent tribute to Lillian. You certainly helped us understand her ingratitude to technology which undergirded her asking for the impossible again and pushing the boundaries of computing and art. Before Lillian went to Bell Labs and created her astonishing series of computer films, she had an extensive history as an artist interested in using technology and novel materials in her work, particularly her sculptures. 
It was this history that eventually brought Lillian to the attention of the art world in New York and set the stage for her work with computers. Let's learn more about this part of her story. Lillian Schwartz's restless exploration of new artistic mediums led to her engagement in the 1960s with other artists who were interested in making art with technology. I would always learn the traditional method and then I'd try to push the medium to find other ways of using it. I think there isn't one medium I didn't touch. But I did study with Joe Jones and studied watercolor. But again, I went to the beach and threw sand on the watercolor and I always did something different with it. Well, I met Billy Kluver at the Bell Laboratories. He was a scientist and very interested in the arts. He was one of the founders of EAT. I went to a few meetings with him and then they had the nine evenings at the Armory where Rauschenberg had tennis brackets wired up and the labs people did something that they entered and it was a very exciting kind of thing. I was doing water sculpture and again I was a big garbage collector and uh, had a lot of tubular things from chemists. Proxima Centauri was one of the days of collecting garbage from factories, so I just wandered in one day, and outside they had some domes, and it turns out that they were making uh, these domes for street lamps for Los Angeles, and they were defects. So I spoke to the owner and uh, told him about my artwork. So he permitted me to do that. It was sitting in my studio for a long time and then this ad came in the New York Times about the exhibition that was going to be held at the Museum of Modern Art, the, the machine at the end of the mechanical age. It came to me what I should do with that and around that time was the moonwalk and I was always interested in astronomy anyway and um, I decided to paint, hand paint, two by two slides of images that would represent space. I had an old Singer sewing machine and I used part of that motor contraption and had a carpenter friend build the base which was a rectangular black structure and inside of this uh, built another base that held the motors and the mechanics for moving a shelf up and down and on this shelf was a slide projector and a mirror that would take the slides and project it over the dome. So when the viewer came up and stepped on the pad, it triggered the dome to recede into the unit. Her Proxima Centauri was one of nine works accepted into the MoMA show. The stage was now set for her pioneering use of the computer as an artist's tool. A true visionary. Lillian's pioneering use of the computer as an artistic tool led to many works. Her imagination soared freely between her technology tools and her art. This reminds me of what Daniel Paul said. Technology, like art, is a soaring exercise of the human imagination. Next, we're pleased to feature Lillian's film, Olympiad. Also on loan from the Henry Ford, this peach features computer-generated athletes in motion, inspired in part by Edward Muybridge's famous photographic studies of horses galloping and people running. Olympiad.
Our second special guest is a distinguished American curator and writer who founded the Video Media Exhibition and Collection Programs at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, where she worked for three decades. She's known Lillian and her art since the 1970s. Today, she is still active, teaching at Columbia University, producing a podcast series, and curating exhibitions. Please join me in welcoming Barbara London. Well, thank you, Daniel. In the early 1970s, I was a young budding curator at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. I wanted to learn everything I could about art and technology. So my research actually started with the catalog for MoMA's provocative 1968 exhibition, The Machine is Seen at the End of the Mechanical Age. This show began with Leonardo da Vinci's drawing of a flying machine, and the show concluded with artwork created at Bell Labs. The machine show featured Lillian Schwartz's atmospheric kinetic sculpture, Proxima Centauri. Her sculpture fit right in with the audiovisual experimentation that was going on back then at interdisciplinary venues. And one of my favorites was the Fillmore East with its music and light shows. Lillian navigated this exciting, edgy experimental terrain at a time when computers were room size and they were the exclusive domain of specialist engineers, namely men. But Lillian knew how to navigate around and within such an impenetrable seeming institutional setting. It was actually her sculpture, Proxima Centauri, that led to her entry into Bell Labs. If we fast forward a decade in the mid 1980s, I jumped at the invitation to visit her studio over at Bell Labs. I wanted to learn more about what she was doing and how she had developed a language of her own out of her own skills of computing, working in cinema, painting, and performance. And it was after a tour of the Bell Labs facility that we sat down and she showed me some of her latest work. And I really had to smile when she called herself a morphodynamist, a term whose etym etymological root has to do with the changing shape of our time. And after all, art of the present is grounded in the past and anticipates the future. At the time of my visit to Bell Labs, she was absorbed by all kinds of new inventions and she was using her computational and programming skills that this led her to a new understanding of artistic uses of these tools. For, the, for most cutting edge um, risk-taking art, it's elusive and very difficult to define. As curators and writers like me, we have to come up with new terms, ones that inevitably will need updating. And it's rigorous art that's created by boundary-baking cross-disciplinary artists like Lillian, who, and their work makes my heart beat. So the ineffability of art like Lillian's is what draws me in. Lillian Schwartz is an ingenious pioneering artist with an impressively productive career. She is critically acclaimed by art historians and writers, curators, and technologists around the world. She's admired for her outstanding accomplishments. Lillian managed to make breakthroughs with every medium she's ever handled. Having lived a creative life to its fullest, we are fortunate that she expanded our knowledge and our perceptions of the world. This venerable artist is most worthy of a lifetime achievement award. And my hat is off to Lillian Schwartz. Barbara, you've truly helped us understand Lillian Schwartz's place in history in new ways. I was really struck by the similarity between technology and art when you said art of the present is grounded in the past and anticipates the future. Thank you. As a trailblazer in her contributions to technology and art, Lillian faced doubters about her work and her interests. Throughout her life, she also faced extraordinary challenges. As Barbara mentioned, Lillian was an early pioneer in domains that were and still are dominated by men. She faced bigotry and overcame serious physical challenges. Hers is a story of ongoing creativity as well as inspiring courage and persistence. 
Let's listen to Lillian herself share more of this story. I was born in Cincinnati, Ohio in 1927. I remember that uh, one of the things that amused me was to draw in the dirt with a stick. My first sculpture was actually some dough that was left over from bread that she was baking. And if I made two trays of Parker House rolls, I could have a lump of dough to make sculpture. And my mother was very interested in culture. So I learned to use Condi crayon and all the materials at a very early age. My father had his first heart attack at 36, unfortunately, and so as sickly, we all went to work very early in order to bring in money to contribute to the family. And when he got too ill to work and we had to move, we moved in the night and uh, the neighbors soon found out we were Jewish. Unfortunately, had a tremendous number of bad experiences. Like the first week we were there, we had a dog that had a painting on it called Jew Dog. It was killed. And uh, my brothers and I were uh, beaten up going and coming to school. My mother decided that we should stay home one day a week because she couldn't stand our getting beating. Well, I wanted to go to college and coming from a very large family, there wasn't any money for that. And uh, the notice came out, this was World War II time, that if you became a United States cadet nurse, they would give you a college education. Not realizing I was an artist, I was very sensitive, it was very difficult for me. The doctors soon realized it, and I ended up painting walls at Christmas time. I met my husband because he came over to tell me not to touch his patients because I was, <laughs> I was just, I wasn't a great nurse. After the war, Lillian and her husband were stationed in Fukuoka, Japan. It was after the war, after the bombing, and they were sending troops over. I began to have severe neck pain and stiffness and backache. By the time I got back to uh, Fukuoka, it was polio, and I was paralyzed from the waist down in my right arm. And there was uh, a night nurse, Toshiro, that recognized that I was an artist and uh, my right hand wasn't moving at all. But he worked with me to use my head to create and move objects by just visualizing every inch of the way. This technique actually was very helpful to me years later when I began to use computers. The films were created in my head completely. In the early years of my computer works, the artist friends that I had were very anti-computer and when I, I was so excited and when I would meet with them uh, and start talking about it, they'd get very bored and turned off and didn't want to hear anything about it. So I soon lost them as friends. But at Bell Labs, Lillian met a kindred spirit. I met Max Matthews very early after joining Bell Labs. He found a little space for me to have an office. We became very good friends when he found that you were a creative thinker. He respected you no matter what your background was. Throughout my life, I was technology driven. And I went from plastics and I went to other materials and lights and kinetic sculpture. And since computers keep changing and continue to change, I have stayed with that medium because it's not consistent, because it's not going to stay where it is. It's constantly changing. Courage, creativity, and change. It's an inspiring story. For over three decades, CHM's Fellows Awards have recognized technology pioneers, legends and unsung heroes who've advanced the field of computing and propelled humanity forward. The first fellow was Grace Murray Hopper, a trailblazer in software programming. Since Grace, CHM has presented this prestigious award to 91 fellows, including many who are in the audience tonight. Truly, these distinguished fellows have changed our world. And here to present the 2021 Fellow Award to Lillian Schwartz is Ken Thompson. A colleague of Lillian's at Bell Labs, Ken is a legendary programmer who co-created the Unix operating system and developed the C programming language, both 
truly cornerstones of today's digital world. In 1997, CHM recognized Ken for his own award, fellow award. Ken, over to you. Well, thank you, Daniel. Uh, Lillian Schwartz is a really amazing person. Uh, when she showed up at uh, Bell Labs around the same time uh, I did, but we sort of never met formally. Uh, the first time I really met her was, uh, it turned out she was a neighbor of mine, not a close neighbor, but maybe 10 or 15 houses away. And on Halloween night, a bunch of kids came by uh, our house and they were all abuzz about uh, seeing Spock's brain down the block. And uh, so anyway, I investigated, went down, knocked on the door, and I was surprised it was Lillian. And sure enough, in her living room, she had Spock's brain. Uh, uh, now, it was a model that she had made f for or uh, 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 the Star Trek, a Star Trek episode uh, uh, in those days. And uh, she brought it out every Halloween, show the kids. They all loved it. So anyway, that's the kind of person she is. Uh, another example is uh, I was in computing in those days, and she was in art uh, of computing. And uh, in 20 years, we only had one day of downtime. And that day was caused by uh, a disk crash, which then was uh, a bad disk that was put into another disk driver, which crashed the, the disk driver, which was then moved to another disk, which crashed another disk, on and on until it had wiped out all of our disks in the whole laboratory. Uh, so there were maybe 10, 15 uh, scientists there just twiddling their thumbs, knowing not what not to do. So, so Lillian came in and uh, suggested that we make a mobile out of these broken disc packs. And it was a huge, uh, a huge thing. It was uh, maybe eight foot tall. It was hung from an I-beam in the ceiling. And uh, uh, I can't tell you how big this thing was, but with disc packs hanging down and, and all balanced. And then she brought in a, um, a ball of magnetic tape. Uh, you can think of it as like a ball of yarn or a ball of rubber bands that people will make and make bigger. But this is magnetic tape that she'd been collecting over years and it was very large. It was oh, three or four foot in diameter and it hung in the center of this mobile and was the, uh, I don't know, the piece de resistance of the mobile. and. Uh, and there are some pictures of that mobile around, maybe you can find them. So, Lillian Schwartz, on behalf of CHM, it is my distinct honor to present you with the 2021 Fellow Award for a lifetime impact through pioneering work at the intersection of art and computing. When you're an artist, you want to create something that's new and different and unusual. And the medium of the computers allowed me to do that. So every day I could do something different. I didn't have to rely on the same thing. If you experiment, it enhances your own creativity because you have different tools to use that allows you to create differently. So you're not always repeating yourself. That's what's, what's wonderful about having computers is that my work was so diversified and it, be, it just kept changing all the time as the machines changed and my programs changed. And for an artist, it, you can't ask for more. I'm very, very moved by becoming a fellow at the Computer History Museum, but it also reminds me of the early days of my first exposure to the computer and how I could change it into a tool for artists I was fortunate to be at Bell Laboratories and work with scientists who were anxious to help me. They were excited about having an artist who was curious about the machine and how I could adapt it to a tool to increase my creativity. And that's exactly what I was able to do. So I, I'm happy that I can make this contribution and also have the 
help of many scientists who wrote powerful code so that I could use a computer like I would use a, a brush. It, it just opened up a whole new world of a way of working for me. What is most important for creativity is to try to use the tools that you have available and extend them to do more than say a brush and just a stroke with a brush, but that you could do more with that brush so that being exposed to computers and working with scientists who helped extend the programming by my telling them what I would like to do is, is the best way an artist can advance her own work, her own creativity. And it was just a marvelous experience to have these at my fingertips. And then also have the scientists that I needed to consult with at times to write new programs. And they liked it too, because I would stimulate them to think differently about using the tools. So it was not only a collaboration with advancing the technology, but also the scientists loved. They would beg to work with me, and that was a nice feeling for me. That would push my own creativity. I was just in awe of the whole thing. It just opened up a whole world for me. It's like getting charcoal for the first time. But this time it was a medium that had such flexibility that it could provoke different creativity in me. Congratulations, Lillian. I am truly honored to be the first one to congratulate you as our newest fellow at CHM. Thank you for your reflections on receiving this coveted award and for your stirring words about experimentation, computing, and creativity. Productive collaborations between artists and technologists, like those that enabled Lillian's important contributions, have continued to the present. How are contemporary artists using cutting-edge computing technologies to create groundbreaking art? And how are trailblazing technologists being influenced and inspired by artists? To explore these questions, we're thrilled to feature a conversation between a world-renowned digital artist, Rafiq Anadol, and the Vice President of Graphics Research at NVIDIA Research, David Lubke. As part of their conversation, Rafiq will share some of the impressive works he has created using artificial intelligence. Thank you, Andy. David, great to be here together today. Rafiq, it's great to see you. It's great to talk to you again. Uh, we're here to celebrate the intersection of art and technology. Yes, happy to. First of all, grateful to be here today for a, such, a meaningful, such a meaningful day. And also as a media artist, I always feel that I am on the shoulders of many giants like uh, Lillian Schwartz and like yourself and many engineers, researchers, people who are finding the near future experiences for humanity. So as an artist, I'm inspired from science and technology and have been practicing with data as a pigment and working with machine learning algorithms to create experiences in immersive environment, architectural scale, or I'm calling it data painting last since 2018 and 2008, sorry, so last 13 years. And the idea of like, can a machine learn? If it can learn, can it dream is a kind of a question I'm trying to follow. Um, last, especially five years, me and my team, I'm not alone. I represent also my studio in Los Angeles. We are 14 people, can speak 14 language, represent 10 countries as a team of uh, thinkers and artists and designers and uh, we are trying to follow uh, the future that you and wonderful researchers are creating for us to imagine that's yeah that's fantastic i think that the um you know my field i'm coming from the technology side my field is 3d computer graphics this is you know has always been a field that's at the intersection of art and technology and and you know it's it's technology in the service of the creative and uh, and so it's so inspiring to see uh, artists like yourself uh, doing this amazing work with uh, the, the things that we build, whether that's the hardware that goes into a, you know, a graphics card that goes in the computer or the algorithms that we develop to take you know, all of this data and train on it and, and, and generate something that is inspired by, that is you know, sort of modeling uh, all the data that it's seen. And, uh, and I think this is a super appropriate place to have this conversation because of course, you know, one of the real progenitors of this was Lillian Schwartz and the incredible art that uh, that, that she did that broke these boundaries and, and sort of created this fusion uh, for the first time, you know, publicly to, to many people. 
I was also as a, like a student at uh, UCLA as a design media art student. The very first thing as a media archaeology class, the first thing that I personally inspired was her incredible 1968 uh, EAT research and also the MoMA exhibition. I mean, there were like uh, like many artists like myself who have been thinking with technology, code, algorithm, computation. I think that's kind of this origin moment, I guess, inspiration for many people. I think that I. I'd really love to, to dive into one of the things you said, uh, the, the idea of sort of treating data as a pigment, because uh, that, that's, that's something that I'm very excited to, to sort of talk about and think about is the, is the way that, that, that sort of gathering data is, is, is how you make art, is, is the first step of how you make art. So can you, can you talk, talk us through a few of the, the, the pieces that you've done and, and then let's, uh, and, and how you've used data in this sort of innovative way? Because when I think about data as a pigment, it's of course not a material we know just in life, in a physical quality, but it's light as a material. But what is inspiring is when algorithms and computational imagination and computer graphics, they all come together, at least in my mind, as a, as, as, as a creative thinking, they suddenly start like emerge into any forms. First of all, for me, data is a form of a memory, which can take many form and many, many shapes and and when we think about light as a material, such as projection, LED technologies, and screens, and when the computer graphics come together, um, they have this new symbiotic relationship. For example, the signals around us, um, the computational research going inside the machine, uh, AI research, or wind patterns, temperature, Wi-Fi, actually everything that we can compute or quantify, I think can become a pigment uh, in this imagination. In many ways, what's exciting is that the artist in this form is is a curator first and foremost, right? You're 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 thinking about you're gathering the data that you want to use that you want to to then pull together, and this this fits so well with how artificial intelligence and neural networks, which is really the the frontier right now of, of my field of, of of so much of computer science, uh, that's how they work, right? You 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 create a training set. And that training set, you know, by selecting your training set, by figuring out the criteria and then going out and gathering it often with enormous sort of manual effort to gather a training set, uh, you, you, you build this, you, you have curated this collection that then, then you sort of turn the machine loose on and, and, and see what happens. And, and I think that that's, um, that's one of the things that I find really inspiring about, about uh, some of the work you've done, especially, you know, a recent example would be your... Um, your work with you know ocean uh, you know ocean photographs right you know photographs of, of marine life essentially and and you know creating this piece that people can then explore themselves I, I find that uh, just such a fantastic use of the of the, the GAN algorithms that we've developed for neural networks within our research. Thank you very much. First of all, literally um, your research specifically style GAN PG GAN pretty much Nvidia's incredible uh, generative adversarial network research is one of the most uh, inspiring research for me and my team, because honestly, if a one day machine can dream, I feel like it's exactly <laughs> what it could like, you know, dream. Um, and when I, when I show the results to friends and families and people who are not any like contextualization of technology, they even sometimes say it's, it feels like I'm remembering a moment in life. Mm. Like, these are really um, very poetic moments when, when a human and a machine interact. It's important to remember, of course, that like every all of us are are standing on shoulders, and 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 the style gan work that you refer to is um is one of the prouder accomplishments, and and it comes from a from an incredible team of researchers in Finland who have um what but what's what's neat to think about is that those researchers uh, took their inspiration in turn from from art, from in particular from this work that was done earlier by Gaddis and others on style transfer, which was you know, realizing that we can sort of separate out the style of a painting, for example, or a sketch from the content and, and actually use neural networks for that. So there's this kind of recursive beauty to it all, right? So the, the, the researchers have been studying, you know, ways to transfer style, artistic styles, and, and, and think about them in a separate, con uh, separate way from the, art, the, the actual content of an image. And that has developed into this algorithm that we call StyleGAN that you've built so much of your stuff on to do these incredible new pieces of art. So it's a, it's, it's a virtuous circle. That's absolutely very true. Like it's it's a very childish baby dream. Like when you like discover a new thing in nature, like calling your friends and families, like I found something new, like that kind of a feeling, um, like a very humanly feeling of discovering and, and innovating a moment. 
And we also like, again, thanks to the incredible um, openly shared documents and, and details of um, these, again, algorithms, we were able to create a kind of another software that allow us like to fly real time in latent space and look for the patterns. And, and that was another like, you know, serendipity. Uh, uh -huh. Like for example, from the flowers, we have like around 70 million flower data that was learned and, and turned into this beautiful flower um, um, AI, flower again. And suddenly we were like recreating these beautiful creatures that are like, I mean, from nature, the beauty. And every time that we do this like latent work, we are discovering new patterns from nature evolving for the landscapes, like the old national parks in the United States, like when we recreate these old beautiful patterns of nature. Um, it's just kind of appreciating the beauty of in life, I guess, in certain memories also. Uh, in a poetic way, also enjoying the cutting edge science and technology. It's it's really inspiring to imagine together. So so let's dive into the StyleGAN uh, algorithm a little bit more. Tell us uh, specifically about, you know, one of the works that you've done that's been sort of inspired by and builds on the StyleGAN algorithm. I'd love to hear some of the sort of the technical details as well as the inspiration. Yes. So again, I think if a machine can learn, can a dream question? very naturally led on to like the style gains incredible opportunity for creators so last five years we you look, uh, collected more than five petabytes of raw data and we train more than 100 ai models that look at the different um, information uh, mostly space nature and urban focus cities like stockholm london new york los angeles istanbul and so on or nature landscape water, clouds, or uh, beautiful creatures under the water world, or uh, space like Hubble telescope or Mars and MRO telescope or ISS telescope. So in these three domains research, we created um, different uh, projects. For example, Machine Hallucination was an immersive environment that uh, created by 18 channel projection, where we use also cutting edge uh, RTX GPUs and reconstructed more than eight IMAX resolution immersive room where the people were stepping inside the mind of a machine in an immersive space. So I just love the concept of, you know, kind of building dream and, and what does what does that seem like? So so uh, please tell us more that I, I want I want to hear more more about the, the Disney Hall project. So for this project, we specifically focus the question, what a memory can be for a building? And um, thanks to LA Philharmonic Archives, we digitize entire um, image archive of the institution, like a 15 years of every performance, every single document um, and video and an image archive. And we train a, a, GAN, a PG GAN algorithm, which is NVIDIA's wonderful research that was very early steps in 2018. And we were able to take what machine learn and project it back to the building as a, as a skin to celebrate the 100 years of the institution. And to make this happen also, we use 42 channel projectors. And to connect 42 channel projectors, we also use cutting edge computer graphics, specifically um, um, mini GPUs together, NVIDIA GPUs together in multiple servers. And we sync them perfectly and achieve a, a kind of a light layer on top of the um, beautiful facade of Disney Hall. And what another, I think, meaningful part of the project was, while it is an exploration of in architecture, AI, and neuroscience or near future um, science fiction experiences, the reality was it was a free public art, a free for everyone, open to anyone and any age and any background. And I think making art and science and technology accessible to humanity through the arts, I think has this very powerful moment. And when you see like, everyone coming together around the building and enjoying life in public space. That's a really moment that you can touch science fiction, but it's there next to you. Amazing, yeah, absolutely, that's super cool. So cool. Rafik's immersive art provides just a glimpse into the breadth of the creative work being generated in partnership with algorithms and machines. For some, these developments might be disconcerting. They do raise the question of what our role will be in an era where machines are able to perform what we consider complex, abstract, creative tasks. The implications on the future of work, education, and human societies could be profound. Yet Rafiq and David, you have exemplified real opportunities to see creativity multiplied through collaboration. Thank you so much for sharing. Earlier in the program, Daniel invited each of you to share one word to inspire the next generation. Well, we've captured those words to share within our virtual environment. 
Created by our partners E2K and Three Monkeys, this short piece provides a digital representation of this community that has come together tonight. It's only fitting that this CHM theme should be created from your words because it's going to take all of us, all of our best ideas and all of our passion to make technology shape a better future for ourselves and our communities. Before we wrap up, I want to add my hearty congratulations to Lillian as our newest distinguished fellow at CHM. We're all inspired by your work and impact. I'd also like to express my gratitude to each of our remarkable speakers and my co-host, Andy Cunningham. Thank you, Daniel. It has been a real pleasure to be part of this program and to honor this amazing woman tonight. Thanks to each of you for joining us from wherever you are in the world. My heartfelt appreciation to each of you for being a member of the CHM community and inviting others to join. Today, the exponential growth of computing power is impacting the human condition around the globe. We are all part of the unfolding story of our digital age. We're living inside the transformation. The decisions we make today about our technology will determine the direction of our lives tomorrow. As Marshall McLuhan penned, we shape our tools and then our tools shape us. In this time of transformation, what does it mean to be human in an age where life as we know it does not exist without computing technology. CHM's 2021 fellows, Ray Ozzy, Raj Reddy, Andy Van Dam, and Lillian Schwartz, have shown us triumph over challenge, the unbounded possibilities of human imagination and creativity, and the potential for technology to extend our human powers to benefit society. It is possible, in the words of our AI artist Rafik Anadol, to create a poetic moment when a human and a machine interact. We're committed to that poetry, to reducing the perils and increasing the possibilities and promise of technology. As digital citizens, we can, in fact, we must work together to shape a better future for all of us. Thank you for joining us on this journey of transformation. Fittingly, we close tonight's program with an excerpt from Lillian's 1974 film set to Salieri's Symphony in D Major. It's called Metamorphosis. Thank you and good night. Thank you.